I'm Shashank Agrawal. I, I do research in cryptography, blockchain, security, privacy, uh, different aspects of these things. Uh, recently, I have joined Coinbase to build a new blockchain research team. Probably not the best time to join Coinbase, but uh, we'll see how it works out. Um, I'm also a research partner at Dell uh, So let's get started. Uh, today we'll be talking about zero knowledge proofs. Zero knowledge proofs are one of the most important technologies in the blockchain space and beyond. In the last five, 10 years, we have seen tremendous strides being made both on the theory side and the practical side of ZKPs, but using them in applications has not been very easy for developers. Several blockchain startups and companies are working hard to address this problem, and we'll get a glimpse of, that, of some of that hard work today. So we have a great line of, lineup of speakers for you. Um, we have Daniel Lubarov from Mir Protocol, just now part of Polygon. Uh, we have Howard Wu from Elio. Uh, we have Shahar Papini from uh, Starkware, Guilty Gayoza from Topology, uh, Gautam Botrell from Consensus, and Joshua Fitzgerald from Anoma. If I mispronounce any name, I'm really sorry, but let's get uh, started. Uh, uh, the talks would be for 40 minutes. So each speaker has between five and eight minutes uh, to give their talk. Then we'll have a discussion panel of about 20 minutes and we'll, we'll hold off all the questions uh, till the end. Uh, in the end, we'll have a 15 minutes Q&A uh, and, and then we'll wrap up uh, this event. Uh, cool. So, Daniel, uh, you have the floor. You are muted, Daniel. Daniel, you are muted. We cannot hear you. Sorry. Is, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I, I work at Polygon Zero, and we're we're building a EVM-based zk rollup. Uh, so I'll be talking about the EVM and how we build uh, zkps for the EVM. Okay, uh, so the EVM is frankly not a very good fit for zkps since it wasn't designed for them. So if we were designing something for zkps, we might give it a more restricted structure. For example, in, in languages like Socrates, you have bounded loops, and that gives us the kind of the rigidness that we need to take a program and compile it into a, a circuit. Uh, another thing is it, if we were designing for ZK, we, we might give it a more restricted memory model, such as Cairo's contiguous write once memory, which is very efficient to check. Um, we also, a, ZK, a snark friendly language would have a way for the programmer to do arithmetic in the native field of the snark, since that's always going to be the, the cheapest and fastest uh, a way to do to do math. And if we need a hash function, we would probably pick something like Poseidon that has low arithmetic complexity. So then EVM has none of that. It has a completely uh, arbitrary control flow, so you can you can do dynamic jumps. So we can't really infer anything about how a program will execute until we actually execute it at runtime. Uh, it has conventional memory, which is more expensive to check because there can be gaps in in the memory log. Uh, it has the the arithmetic is in binary, so it's not really native to the field that we use. And it's, it's also a very large word size. Everything is basically 256 bits. So e even simple math can be a little bit expensive. And finally, the standard hash function is Ketchak 256, which is pretty expensive to compute in ZKPs. Uh, but with, with all that said, we still want to support EVM because first of all, it's just the, the most popular blockchain language. And it's really the only option if we want, if developers want a multi-chain application, it, it's pretty much the only practical option today. So here's Aave, for example. Aave is a pure Solidity app, and it's running on these 10 different platforms with the same, Solid, the same Solidity code base because they all have EVM support. So, 
so I, I won't have time to get into a lot of the challenges of supporting the EVM, but I, I just wanted to pick one as an example, which is multiplication. So we're again, the word size is 256 bits. So here we're doing this really big multiplication uh, with 256 bit inputs and the product will be 512 bits. If we did this, uh, so we can't really fit a 256 bit number in the field that we're using. So we have to split it up into 16 small limbs. And then if we did this using the grade school algorithm, we would have 256 intermediate products, which is pretty, pretty unreasonable. Um, we could ignore almost half of them because we're only taking the uh, less significant half of the 512 bit product. Um, but even then it's well over a hundred intermediate products that we're calculating. So we need a better method to do this. And what we can do since we're using ZKPs is we can have the prover supply what they claim is the product. So they supply C, which should equal A times B. And then there are various methods where we can check that this identity does hold. So let's take this example. We're doing 19 times 31, just in base 10 as an example and the prover claims that the product is 589. So th there's this really classic trick for checking identities like this, which is, it's called casting out nines and it's kind of a grade school trick. Um, and the idea is that instead of checking the identity itself, we check it mod nine. And if it holds mod nine, then probably it holds the identity itself probably holds. Um, so checking at mod nine is really easy if we're working in base 10 because 10 is equal to one mod nine. So whenever we have a multi-digit number, we can just add up all the digits without changing, changing anything mod nine. So we do this a few times and then we're left with a really trivial thing to check at the end, like one times four equals four. Um, we, we can do this, like I said, this is only a probabilistic check. Something could hold mod nine, but it doesn't hold, the original identity might not hold. So what we can do is we can add additional moduli. So let's say again, if we're working in base 10, we could add 10 as an extra moduli that we check. We check the identity mod 10, which is very trivial because um, we only have to look at the last digit of any number. Uh, we could also check it, let's say mod 11. That's also pretty easy because uh, 10 is congruent to negative one mod 11. So for example, 589 becomes five minus eight plus nine. And we follow a similar process where we can shrink these numbers and then check this very small equation at the end. Um, uh, uh, so after we've checked this identity under several moduli, if it holds under all those moduli, that implies that it holds under the least common multiple of those moduli. In this case, the LCM is 990. So the identity holds mod 990. And if we know that both sides are smaller than 990, then we can conclude that the identity itself does hold. So th this is like, uh, one, one way we could do EVM, th this, this really big multiplication problem for the EVM is we could come up with a list of moduli that are small, so they fit in our field. And then we check this identity under, let's say about 10 moduli. Um, and then each individual check is really cheap because we're working with small numbers that fit in our field and we're doing native arithmetic. Um, this was an algorithm that we were considering using. We actually came up with another algorithm that, that seems even better than this technique that uh, our, our teammate Hamish came up with, and that'll be a, a separate talk at, at some point. So that's about it for me. And now I'll hand it back to Shoshank. Thanks. Thank you, Daniel. That was very interesting. Uh, next up, we have Howard Wu from Alio, who will talk about uh, uh, Leo, the language of Alio. Thanks. Let me share my screen here.
Can everyone see this? I will yes, take that as a yes. All right. <laughs> um, thanks. Uh, first off, thanks for having me. And um, my name is Howard. I'm a co-founder of Helio. Um, and today I want to talk a little bit about Leo. Um, before diving into it, I think on a high level, the first thing to kind of conceptualize for everybody is just the, the framework in which we're thinking through this model. Um, uh, li like all of the other presenters, you know, there is this new paradigm in terms of on-chain and off-chain executions, which we're all experimenting with and reasoning through and creating user journeys for. I think, uh, you know, in terms of the model that we're going for, what we're thinking through is um, developing a language called Leo, which allows you to write applications. The, 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 goal of, the goal of a language like this, frankly, is to um, provide syn syntax that looks and feels a lot like TypeScript or Rust for those who are familiar with those languages. Um, so that it provides a safe environment for developers who, you know, may not know ZK well, um, and for those who do, to be able to leverage a language like that in order to um, optimize the uh, constraint counts and therefore the performance um, to the extent that they have semantic and, and domain-specific knowledge. Um, to the extent that that application is built and compiled, the goal is to execute them on provers. Uh, in this case, um, you know, Alia is a network that facilitates provers, and so um, the goal is to be able to run those applications in real time and deploy them, host them, and, and store them on chain. And uh, that's where the ledger comes in naturally. All right, in terms of programming, you know, the model that we have is actually, frankly, uh, quite, quite straightforward, at least to start. The goal is to really make it easy for people to, to jump into the language and, and, and start writing things. Um, to give you a small preview, this is, uh, you can go to this URL, actually, play.leo-lang.org. It's a playground that we've set up in order to start um, giving people the ability to quickly test and iterate um, with, with Leo. Um, and, and by the way, we're always open to feedback and there's uh, links on the bottom left there in order uh, to, to share, to also uh, file issues and also um, to, uh, to ask questions uh, on Discord to the extent that, that, that your, your journey uh, comes up with questions. But um, you know, the goal here is to really create an environment that allows you to quickly execute, to quickly run, um, and also to, to iterate. Uh, you know, the, the language itself comes with a testing framework, which makes it easy to write unit tests. Um, as well as, uh, you know, the, the expected semantics, you know, we add in things like fields and groups, which uh, all of us here have become much more comfortable, um, you know, writing cryptographic primitives in. Um, certainly, they're far more performant, uh, as Daniel has pointed out in, in his talk. Um, I think that one of the things that that going forward, you know, as a as a industry, we need to think about is really just, you know, how do we bridge the gap between domain specific knowledge in this algebraic universe versus the kind of traditional bitwise universe that we that we're all used to um, when it comes to programming. And that's something that from a semantic standpoint, I think for developers entering this space, you know, there's going to be quite a lot of challenges. And so this is something that we've we've basically spent a lot of time thinking through. Um, and I think we've gotten a lot of the parts right. There's also a lot of the parts that still need a lot of work. Um, and that's where feedback from the community is, is highly valuable. In terms of the, the implementation that we've we've gone through, um, the approach is really to to write the compiler in Rust, and and a huge part of this objective is honestly to um, give the language as much of a memory safetyness as we can. Um, as you know, reasoning through a model like this can be quite complex, and so um, one of the things that we're trying to do is to minimize the amount of abstractions um, uh, via you know good layers of abstractions um, from the compiler side. Um, and certainly the performance of a language like Rust is uh, competitive, if not better, to C++ in many instances. And so, you know, in terms of generation and in terms of uh, proof, proof generation and verification, we're trying to keep this as performant as possible. In addition, um, one of the efforts that we've taken is really to, to employ formal methods. Um, you know, in, there has been a lot of concern um, uh, by specific groups about um, you know, the circuits that are constructed and also the safety of the, of the programs that are synthesized um, because you're starting from a high level domain and synthesizing it down into, well, what is effectively polynomials. And um, you know, in that process, we wanna make sure that every step of optimizations that are taken are correct. And so you know, one of the, the common methods that can be employed is to use formal methods. And in our case, we use ACL2 to do that. Um, we, we apply this uh, uh, one to the compiler itself but then two, also to the actual, in our case, R1CS circuits that we synthesize out in order to express the language in its polynomial form. And uh, lastly, the language is open source. There are formal specifications for it. They're, 
I will admit it's quite long, 70 plus pages, but they're available online and uh, it should give you a, a bit of uh, intuition in terms of what, what we have worked on. And uh, just to cover the performance on a, on a system like this, um, you know, this is uh, to give you a heuristic estimate in order to understand what different types of algorithms and different types of applications might, might incur in terms of uh, cost. Um, you know, today the runtimes for these are frankly quite fast to synthesize um, and uh, still, you know, reasonably, reasonably fast to, to execute. Um, but it certainly takes a little bit longer than, you know, I think we would like and certainly many, many in this industry would like um, relative to traditional uh, programming languages and their compilers. Um, but the constraint counts end up being quite competitive that uh, um, despite the layers of abstraction, they end up remaining um, quite performant uh, and uh, fairly close to handwritten circuits, which is something that we're certainly very excited about um, because we think that this can make things um, uh, very much easy for, um, you know, developers to actually understand and iterate on the cost cycles and try to develop a skill for, for optimizing uh, ZK constraints. Um, and, and that's, that's the, the, the goal for us is to make it, make it an educational experience. And so this is where we've started. This is where things are at. And, uh, and, and this is what the performance looks like today. Um, and, and in terms of just where you can find resources on this front, uh, Leo itself is uh, on a website called leo-ling.org. Um, we have a full paper for this as well online. Uh, if you go to paper.leo-ling.org, it should redirect you to an ePrint uh, PDF. And uh, lastly, the code is available on GitHub. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thanks. Thank you, Howard. Uh, great talk. Next, we have uh, Shahar Papini and uh, Gildi Gyoza, who will talk about application development on Cairo. Hey, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Great. So I'm a, I'm Shahar. I'm a, a, an engineer from Stalker. I worked uh, on Cairo. And first of all, uh, let me say that the, the two talks that just uh, uh, Howard and Daniels were very interesting. I, I learned a lot and I'm, I definitely have a lot of questions for you later, guys. So uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I want to talk a little about uh, the Cairo design philosophy. Um, uh, Daniel stole uh, some things uh, I wanted to say, but uh, in the other direction. Uh, indeed, when you think about something uh, like EVM or anything uh, uh, that the word knows uh, in a CPU architecture, it's, it's usually a uh, read-write memory and uh, bitwise operations, uint 64s and such. And like Daniel said, it doesn't really fit well into the ZKP world. It, it just doesn't come as efficient. Now at Starkware, we actually chose the other uh, side of the spectrum, not to stay uh, compatible with everything else, but to do something uh, completely new. Uh, we mainly want to do something that is very fast, very scalable, very efficient. That is the main uh, main things that guide us while doing Cairo. And um, now, what we wanted from Cairo is so that it could be expressive enough, so you can write like whatever you, you want, and it should be like a Turing complete uh, machine. And still, we wanted to keep it simple and uh, have a an efficient set of equations to prove it. Now, uh, just a quick note, uh, as opposed to uh, uh, compilers that generate constraints, uh, this is uh, not like that. We don't generate constraints for every program you write. Instead, we have one set of cons constraints that validates the valid execution of Cairo. And that has a lot of benefits. Uh, it's similar in uh, the ZKEVM uh, case. It just means you have just one verifier. You can see it once. You can batch a lot of programs together. Uh, so it has a lot of benefits using uh, some virtual machine and verifying it using equations. Now, things uh, we chose in Cairo that 
maybe make uh, the lives of programmers uh, uh, unfamiliar. Uh, the basic data types, okay, uh, there are field elements instead of uh, uints, which makes sense. Uh, but the other uh, maybe weird thing we, we chose is the memory model, which I think no one was crazy enough to do this kind of weird memory model. Um, this is the continuous uh, write once memory. And basically it's an immutable memory. You can't write twice to, to things you already wrote and you only can only use consecutive addresses, which sounds very restrictive at the beginning, but the more we thought about it, the more we figured, yeah, we can write things uh, in this memory model. They'll probably be more functional like because you, you know, functional programming is using mostly immutable things. And, and we and we, we did choose this uh, mainly because, okay, this was pl a plausible memory model and it was very efficient to verify in ZKPs. Uh, just uh, to give you a few numbers, uh, we, the, the way we measure the efficiency of the uh, our constraints are by the number of variables and each instruction in Cairo takes only 50 variables while others take maybe a thousand at least. It uh, depends on how uh, efficient it is, but Cairo is very efficient in that regard. And mainly because we chose the less standard uh, ways to program. No. Uh, okay, I talked about the Cairo architecture and there are a lot of choices we did that are non-standard that make it efficient. But other than the Cairo architecture, the other thing uh, we have is the, what we call the Cairo language which seems like a high level language uh, on top of the Cairo ar architecture. It's not really a high level language. It started as an assembly uh, and we added some uh, nice features and that's what you mostly have today. So it's not the easiest to, to write in and uh, it gets better over time. Uh, but, uh, but the most of the, I'd say, things that are not comfortable there are just due to the fact that the compiler is not good enough. And we are currently working on a, a new compiler, uh, something that will also resemble a maybe Rust-like language and that should take away most of the difficulties. But that is our hope. Um, so yeah, that, that is uh, basically uh, where we're at and where we are heading. And guilty Gielsa, you want to take it from here? <clears throat> Hello, yes. Thank you, Shahar. Um, well, we're obviously avid users of Cairo, so very grateful of your invention. Um, today we're here to talk about um, our thoughts being an application developer in the space. Um, I'm Gyoti Gyoza, I'm co-founder of Topology. So I think the, the high sort of level thought is that um, we're, we're here to talk about building ZKP systems and make them more accessible. But I think it's very important to think about why would programmers build on these systems at all in the first place? Until so, uh, next slide, please. I think rough, rough, very rough statistics show that um, about one percent of programmers in the world right now program on blockchains. And I think the question is why? As in, we are all enthusiastic about this technology, but in a grander scheme of things, very few people understand or um, share our same enthusiasm. <clears throat> uh, well, we would argue that um, it's important for us to imagine bigger. And we have to be genuine in our observations, in our convictions, what we believe in and what we want to build. <clears throat> well, obviously, right? Um, next, Bill Gates, Larry Page, Mark Zuckerberg won't build the same things that they were known for. Um, next blockchain, the next rollup won't be known for running another AMM or another play to earn scheme. 
So then what would be the next sort of frontier, right? The application domain where there will be exponential growth, exponential impact, and also inviting exponentially more programmers into the space and share our enthusiasm. Well, at Topology, we believe in building on-chain realities. We, our mission at the company is to enable people to actualize their true potential in these ever-inclusive realities that are settled on-chain, these realities where the role sets are enforced on the blockchain, settle on the blockchain in the form of verifiable programs or smart contracts. And we recognize that there are key technical hurdles, which is we want to achieve interoperability and composability uh, in terms of uh, object behavior across different realities. <clears throat> um, here are some, some of the domains we have touched upon ever since last August when we started to build on StarkNet using Cairo. Uh, we've built a prototype for logical simulation. This is for uh, circuit simulation. We've built a rudimentary physics simulation using numerical methods. We've uh, played with various game loop architectures. They're uh, crucial in building any game engine or any games at all. Um, we've, we've dabbled in game AI behavior systems necessary for building NPCs. And we have uh, experimented happily with various uh, scripts for generating Small contracts in Cairo that uh, implement SVGs, MIDI files, uh, GLTF files, and very small toy-like DNNs. And so from these experiences, I think we have uh, gleaned some intuitions and opinions that we think might be useful for um, builders building these ZKB systems moving forward. Um, we think it's it might be very useful to head towards, I see. Um, I'll, I'll wrap up quickly. So I think it's it might be very useful to um, use a multi-level IR stack because um, on a lower level, if we share the same standardized IR, we can achieve a uh, cross execution environments sort of uh, compatibility. Um, we think that it's very important for infrastructure builder to work with application builder uh, to understand their requirement and to design the systems accordingly. Uh, we, we, we believe in composition over inheritance, very uh, useful for comp compositionality. And also we want to have function purity guarantees so that we can, from an application standpoint, we can permissionlessly accept um, composable programs and composable components. These are uh, for building hyperstructures. Uh, last slide, I'd like to thank Peteris Ahrens, Zaki Manian, and Justin Glover for their inspirations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shahar. And thank you, Guilty Gyoza. Um, very nice talk. Next up, we have Gautam from Consensus. We'll talk about uh, their Zeek is NARC language, NARC. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so hi, everybody. So as mentioned, I'm working at Consensus the last few years. I've uh, been a core contributor to GNARC, which is a Zeek is NARC library, not a language. And the goal of the presentation is kind of give an overview of what's under the hood of a Zeek is NARC library and, and how we build a constraint system under the hood. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so GNARC was started a bit more than two years ago. Uh, it's written in Golang uh, with an easy to use API to write circuits. Uh, we support uh, cross-testing Plonk uh, with KZG, Plonk with high commitment scheme on multiple curves. Uh, for the type of use case we are looking at, I'm not going to draw numbers, but uh, uh, like large circuits, typically like roll-up operators that need to batch verify thousands of transactions with uh, 60, 80, 90 million of constraints in the circuit. Uh, we are very happy with the performance on, on CPU of our library. And if you look at the, at the diagram on the right, uh, what you see usually in ZK SNARK library is the, the lowest layer on the stack is field arithmetic, which is a fancy word to say big integer library, big integer arithmetic modulo prime. On top of that, you have a couple of arithmetic uh, cryptographic primitives. Uh, some are linked to elliptic curve cryptography, some are not. And for us, all this lives in a repo called GNARC Crypto. On top of that, uh, the ZK SNARC space, which lives in GNARC, uh, you have two parts and it's borrowed from the compiler lingua, which is the front end. Its role is to consume a source code from a program and, and generate a data structure that's consumable by the backend that's going to generate and verify proof. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so a bit of, of zoom on the, what the front end does. So as I said, uh, you have a program as input, source code. You are going to parse it either with a compiler or just with your API and you, with your API code. You're going to build a, a data structure 
that uh, contextualize the information from the from the program. And what you want to output is a list of mathematical constraints, and uh, and, and that's the lowest level representation that you have. So that's what's um, consumed by the backend. Uh, the, the input to the backend is just a list of mathematical constraints. So the two constraints that I put here, the one on the top is uh, from R1CS, and the one on the bottom is from Planck Sharmatization. And one key thing to remember is all the coefficients and elements in these mathematical constraints are field elements. So even if your API, your, your language uh, kind of abstracts that or lies to you and tell you you can you know, manipulate bits or booleans or, or, or floats or these kind of elements, uh, deep down under, under the needs, they are encoded as field elements. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so starting from the bottom to the top, uh, if you have a, if you want to encode in a snark uh, that a value equals a, a polynomial expression like this, uh, you will you can write your constraints manually. So you can write end by line by line each constraint. So for everyone, yes, it will end up with the grossly speaking these three constraints and or Planckish like arithmetization for these five constraints. And uh, next slide, please. So obviously it's too low level and we need some abstraction because for any real life use case, uh, typically to verify signature in a snark, uh, even if you sign the signature scheme is snark friendly and it uses algebraic construct, it's going to take thousands of constraints. And if it's not snark friendly, it's going to take millions of constraints. So of course, well, it's not doable to write that by hand and for each circuit you want. It's error prone, you cannot reuse bits of constraints for circuits, it's not developer friendly and so on and so on. Uh, moreover, you are missing on some compiler optimization, uh, whether it is a compiler on the API, again, it's a matter of choice, where um, things that you want, you cannot do by hand very easily, like uh, factorize linear expressions and merge multiple constraints into one and, and reduce the number of constraints that are generated uh, in such a way that, well, less constraints equals less work for the prover. Uh, so definitely the, the abstraction, the compiler is going to take care of that for you. Um, so to do this abstraction, well, either you go with the domain specific language and you build a tool chain, uh, some block, some uh, idea plugins, some documentation, some uh, you maintain the tool chain and the ecosystem and so on, you do some specification, and et cetera. And, and some key advantage I think of, of domain specific language is, um, well, it can extract more contextual information than an API in many cases. It can be more expressive. Uh, I, I know the, we mentioned uh, Turing completeness and you know you can do if statement for loops and all these kind of constructs that are not very snark friendly. Uh, you can manage memory access uh, and make that transparent for the for the for the developer much more uh, I would say easily than, than an API. And and all you know it can since you have more context you can do more things at the intermediate representation layer. Uh, so at the DAP level one last thing that I want to add on that is uh, well your snark are you looking to put your snark in a protocol or an application at the applicative layer. If you do that at the DAP or the applicative layer, then having a DSL enforce an opinionated way to integrate that with your protocol or with your blockchain. Uh, so with Mark, we chose to do an API. So you import it as a, as you, yeah. Uh, you, you import it as a, you would a normal API, right? Uh, you know, the normal library to verify signatures. And the key benefits of that from us, and, and it's been proven the past few months that were very useful is, uh, well, you have stable mature tooling for us, it's Golang. So it's free now to build and it's free in the future. We don't need to maintain that. Uh, unit testing, you, you, you test and debug and benchmark like you would any piece of code. The package management, how you share packages and import uh, packages is, is the same, right? It's, it's very easy to do. Uh, another key feature, it's actually extensible. You don't need to, uh, to fork or to contact the dev team behind the, the compiler or the, the language to, to, to do some modification. One key example, I'm not going to go in all of them, but the, the first one, the test engine, I think is quite cool is, so in now, for example, you can compile a circuit, give a, build, a builder object that builds a constraint system, or you can pass an execution engine that's going to execute the circuit with witness that you generate. And, and it's very helpful for developing circuits, cross-testing against non-circuit implementation and so on. Um, so that makes it easy to port uh, plain algorithms. So typically when you want to verify Merkle proof or signatures or whatnot, you are going to implement that outside the circuit in plain Go or plain Rust or whatnot. And then you want to port it inside the circuit with different tricks. And, and the fact to share this common idiom and share this same way of testing and so on is, is very helpful on, on the dev side. Uh, we can talk about that later, but it highlights what is efficient to do in a snark circuit and what's not, because you are not hiding too much stuff from the developer. And uh, something we didn't speak too much about is the way we did it is not tied to any blockchain and to blockchain in general. 
So if you need to put Snark in a chat application in, in whatever use case you have in mind, uh, being tied to an ecosystem when you write your Snark is a, uh, is, uh, is that. So he says that I'm out of time and it's good because I just have one slide left uh, and I'm done. So next slide. Uh, so we have a playground also. Uh, you can I invite you to visit it to, to check how you can write a circuit. Uh, you can write and compile with Plunk or Grow16 online and, and check the constraints that are generated. And we have a couple of examples that uh, I invite you to try. And as uh, Alio and as uh, Oward mentioned, we are very open to feedback too on uh, improving that. Thank you all. Thank you, Gautam. Uh, very nice talk. And we have the last talk for the day. Uh, of course, we have a panel after this. Uh, it's from Joshua from Anoma, who will talk about vampire for circuits. Hello. Uh, I'm going to uh, share my screen here. OK, uh, we can all see this? Yes. OK, uh, yeah, Vampire is a, um, it's a universal uh, intermediate representation for circuits. Uh, it's, it's just a way to write arithmetic circuits um, in, a, uh, it's a, in a universal way. It doesn't use uh, R1CS or Plonkish constraints uh, natively. It, uh, it just uses um, polynomials. Um, so the vampire can be used to uh, to translate circuits from um, one constraint system to another. If you want to target uh, different proof systems, or if a new proof system is invented, which they you know they keep coming up with new ones, um, and it uses a different kind of constraint system, uh, your your vampire circuit uh, can still be used in this uh, in new environment. Um, <clears throat> I have uh, way too many slides to, to show in, in the amount of time, so I hope you'll uh, tolerate me bouncing back and forth um, to the most important ones. Um, uh, circuits written in Vampire, uh, like I said, can be compiled to any proof system with any arithmetic constraint system or configuration. Uh, also, it uh, can be used with custom gates or lookup tables. So if you're using Plonk or, or lookup or something, um, it still works. So uh, arithmetic circuits here. Um, here's an example. This is a, a four-bit range proof. Um, you have a, a kind of circuit uh, graph diagram there, as well as the, uh, the polynomial constraints that, uh, that make it up. Um, so uh, yeah, we have uh, multiple constraint systems here and they're not exactly compatible. Um, it's pretty annoying um, that we uh, have these incompatible constraint systems. Um, at Anoma, we have uh, pretty complicated um, uh, stack, uh, and uh, we have some circuits that are uh, pretty complex with a lot of different components. Some of these components were written um, a few years ago. Uh, one is uh, the MASP, the Multi Asset Shielded Pool, which is an extension of uh, Zcash's sapling. Uh, so we wrote this in um, R1CS to be used on uh, with the Bellman Library. Um, but now we are uh, curious about um, aggregation and recursion with uh, a library like Halo 2 uh, or um, making circuits a little more efficient with something like uh, Plonk with lookups and custom gates. And uh, that would require us to rewrite uh, a, a complex circuit that we already have in R1CS rewrite it into Plonk. Um, I uh, spent some time on this and it was extremely uh, frustrating. Um, it's, it's just hard to, to translate these things. Um, certain tricks you can use in R1CS, you can't use in Plonk. Uh, we have, um, we've audited the MASP circuit in R1CS. If we change it to Plonkish, we have to 
get it audited again. Um, so it's it's annoying that to write a circuit, you have to have a um, constraint system in mind, maybe even a backend library in mind um, before you, you start writing it. And um, you don't always know what, uh, what the best system is. Um, also, uh, other people have mentioned some of these annoyances here already. Um, when you write circuits in different constraint systems, they look different. Um, they uh, may not resemble the source. Uh, you have to rewrite them. It's painful to benchmark and different proof systems and configurations. Uh, let's say you have a circuit and you, you, you wanna know uh, which, uh, which backend library is, is gonna be the best. Well, you have to rewrite it a bunch of times. I uh, just get a benchmark, um, it's really unfortunate. Um, there's no canonical circuit format. So if you're publishing a spec um, in, uh, in one circuit format, uh, it's, it's not gonna be as, um, uh, it's not gonna specify completely in, uh, in some other format. Uh, iterating on circuit design is difficult. Front end languages or DSLs. Uh, can become tied to a particular constraint system, which is unfortunate. Um, DSLs are extremely important for, for writing circuits. It's uh, really difficult to write them by hand. Uh, but then if you write it in a DSL, then you're, you're kind of stuck. Uh, so um, this is why we have Vampire. Uh, it's a variable, or excuse me, uh, vampire, alias, multivariable, polynomial, intermediate representation. Um, it is uh, essentially a language for writing uh, polynomials, which represent these arithmetic circuits. And uh, you can give these uh, collections of polynomials um, a name and, uh, and use them at kind of as if they were functions. Um, so I'll um, show you uh, an example here. Um, so here's some polynomial constraints. Uh, these are, I believe, uh, Twisted Edwards edition. Um, you can um, uh, add elliptic curve points using these constraints here. Um, so you can, uh, give uh, a set of constraints a name like this here, um, and then uh, you can compose them together. Um, and uh, when you do that, uh, things start to look kind of nice. Um, you can, uh, for instance, um, here's uh, a circuit written in Vampire, a uh, sapling output circuit and uh, it hides all of the, uh, the polynomials and it looks a lot more like the, uh, the spec. Um, I think I'm uh, pretty close to being out of time. Uh, so yeah, this is what we're working on, um, trying to have uh, this intermediate representation that you can target with uh, multiple DSLs and um, so you don't have to rewrite circuits if you wanna change the, uh, the backend library you want to use. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joshua, very informative. Um, so we can get started with the panel now. Uh, we have uh, all the speakers we have had so far will join the panel, and we have two more panelists, Wei Dai and uh, Janju Chen. Um, would you like to take a minute and, and talk about yourselves? Oh, hi, uh, I'm Yanju. I'm a researcher from Veridice. Um, we do automatic program analysis and formal verification for blockchain. And then we also uh, develop verification tools of both L1 and L2 networks. And for example, we have ongoing projects for uh, building automated formal verification tools for a Cairo program and for CK, uh, for CERCOM and for RNCS constraint systems. So uh, it's my pleasure to attend the panel. So I'm also happy to discuss uh, topics related to ZK formal verifications, both uh, online and offline. Yeah, thank you. 
Great to have you here, Babe. Um, I'm Wei Dai from Bank Capital Crypto. I'm a research partner here, and I split my time between uh, doing research and um, the investment side of things. And uh, recently, I've been spending all time on um, looking at you know different cryptographic techniques and their applications to privacy and scalability. Um, I will keep it brief and answer questions in the panel. Cool, thank you. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, if if someone in the audience has a question for the panel, then please post it in the chat. Uh, we may not have time to go through all the questions, um, uh, but but let's see. Um, so next slide, please. Okay. Right. So, you know, the the first thing that we could talk about here is that uh, we have seen so many languages today um, to build zero knowledge applications. Uh, if someone has to choose. Uh, between these languages, then then how do they choose, right? What metrics should they use to base their choice on? Uh, maybe I'll go first. Um, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. So you know, for if you're trying to choose your ZK language, uh, it really depends on your use case. But you know, I think that the first thing is simplicity, how easy it is for you to use it. Uh, this uh, zero, zero, uh, this language, you know, if you're coming from, uh, you already have something written, maybe in Solidity, maybe something else, then you need to make sure you, maybe you can start from your existing code and port it somehow. Uh, or just use it as is, or uh, just have a, an easy life. Mm -hmm. This is the, the I think the most important metric in my eyes. And and another, uh, the second uh, metric maybe, uh, you know, if you need scalability, then maybe you should use something that is efficient. But uh, not all use cases uh, require it. But the scalability is also a good metric. And I think, I think the third metric in my eyes is the ecosystem. How big and developed is the ecosystem around this language? How, how much support you will get? This, this in my eyes are the three uh, most important metrics. Makes sense, makes sense. Would somebody would, like add on to that? Yeah. Please. I would add on to Shahar's points. Like I, I think the use case one is actually a, a really big one in the sense that um, depending on the domain that you develop uh, your application in, the properties and trade-offs you get are actually quite large. And you know, to Shahar's point, like there's there's many languages that are, um, you know, very Solidity compatible, and many languages that are not Solidity compatible. And uh, for application developers coming from the Ethereum or similar ecosystem today, um, you know, I think that the portability of that is important. I think on the other side of things, you know, there is also you know the question of um, in terms of use cases, what you need out of a system that you build on, right? Because the language itself gives you um, one set of, of uh, kind of uh, things in your tool belt. But, um, you know, the other thing is that where your, where your application state lives and how it lives also makes a huge difference on the, the use case and its experience. Like um, if you need it to be quickly available, um, you know, you might, you might want it off chain. If you, if you want it to be widely persistent, you may want it on chain. Um, and then, of course, from the other perspective, there's this question of do you want it fully public or fully private or something in between. Um, but I think that these are th these end up creating a set of choices for developers where it really depends on your application. Like I think uh, when you think about like like and this is to Vitalik's uh, blog post recently, uh, I think just yesterday or two, two days ago. You know, when you're thinking about like a Uniswap type of application where you need to have some concept of a, of a global uh, reserve balance for token A and token B. Um, you really do need the ability to have some some concept of on-chain state that's shareable across parties. Um, but if you're thinking about, you know, just to put a silly example out there, like a slot machine where it's not peer-to-peer -peer interactive, it's just you playing against a, an algorithm, um, you don't need that. You know, you can do that off-chain and you can even do that off-chain for, you know, 2,000 iterations of pulling the handle um, and then you broadcast the result. And so that's why I say, like, I think that the, the domain with which the language is built in makes a huge difference on what applications it can support then. Great answer. I have two quick points to, to, to that. Uh, first one is, uh, well, also it depends what is, how the, when we are talking about the ZKP language, 
is the goal of the language to hide to the developers that you are even using ZKP at all? Like they don't know that they're using ZKP and it's part of the platform. Or is the developer or the user looking to actually put ZK Snark at the protocol level or ZK, another type of ZKP at the protocol level? Because for the first one, it's almost, yeah, there's, there's many other criteria than just uh, uh, the, the language itself, right? It's as, as Howard mentioned, it's a platform choice. Uh, are you looking for privacy? Are you looking for scalability? There's so many other criteria than the language itself. And you're going to pick the platform, right? Are you picking IO, Aztec, or Starkware, or whatnot? It's not specifically the language that you're going to pick first, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think the state of affairs today is that typically developers aren't really choosing the language. It's more like they're choosing which ecosystem or which platform they want to deploy on based on, for example, how much do they care about wallet support? How much do they care about um, gas fees and uh, the, the considerations like that? And then once they make that decision, then they backtrack from there and say, okay, what, what languages can I use that, that are going to be compatible? But, but I think in the future, this will be less of an issue because as we get more transpilers and more um, kind of generic platforms, like, like for example, Risk Zero, which just supports Risk Five as its native platform, so you you can pretty much choose any language you like with a platform like that. Thanks. Uh, I yeah, we have we have some questions from the audiences as well. Um, let's take one question from the audience. Uh, uh, it's it it goes something like this: Why the read? Why the write once memory module is better? Than the conventional write read module in zkvm design. I mean, I can answer it. Why it's a, it's very in a zero knowledge domain. Um, well, we need to understand that at the end we have some polynomial equations that need to verify this thing. And okay, how do you verify a memory? Uh, if you had a, a read a, a table uh, that showing you the all the accesses in chronological order of your of your uh, memory, it says ah, uh, in the first instruction I I wrote this value, in the second instruction I wrote this value, the, and here I, I read something. How would you go and verify this in polynomials? Well, you would do some kind of a, a, a sorting trick. There is like a, a polynomial trick to sort all these uh, entries and you would sort it chronologically. And then you would need to add some polynomial constraints that make sure that uh, if you uh, uh, exist, uh, okay, you sort it by the address and then by the, and then you have some local constraints. But all of these have a big uh, coefficient. So it's really just a very engineering, engineering thing that, that, that save you uh, uh, cells and, and equations. In the, uh, the C, maybe ZK uh, more efficient way uh, to make, uh, to do the memory, which is continuous right once, it's basic, basically a, a read-only memory. You think about it as a read-only memory. Uh, and this is very, very, easy to uh, verify. You just need to verify that there are, aren't two accesses with the same address that has have different values. So it's basically verifying read-only memory. It's very efficient, less constraints, and, and you can use it as right once because you have non-determinism. So it's both non-determinism and read only that give you like a right once. And you can read about it uh, in the pa Cairo paper. But uh, yeah, I hope I answered the question. So we have more questions from the audience, but uh, uh, let, uh, we have some of our own. So we'll first go through those. Um, next slide, thank you. Um, right, so this question, like, what does the panel think about this question? Will generalized systems like ZKVMs replace ZK specific languages in the future? I, th I think I'll uh, give a quick answer at the, here because um, I'll have to go, uh, unfortunately. So I think the, there's you know, a difference between use cases, like I mentioned before, between using ZK for scaling and using ZK for privacy. 
And if you look at, you know, ZKVM or general ZKVMs, they're often designed for scaling purposes, right? And uh, so I think there's still a need for, for DSLs and for you to program really, really small circuits for, for privacy. For instance, if you want to build Turner cache, Zcash uh, type circuits, uh, I think there's less of a need for, for ZKVM in that case. So, so I still think there's, you know, a, a place for both of these approaches. And thanks for having me here. I'll have, I'm to have to jump. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I, I want to add to like, it's the analogy I always give. I think uh, the general system won't replace specific uh, languages in the same way that uh, CPUs don't replace integrated circuits. I mean, yes, most of the of today's programs are programmed in, in the assembly that runs on CPUs, but a lot of the hardware and other stuff are written in, are in integrated circuits. So in the same way, general programs that users write to probably uh, be mostly logical, business logic, and will be on the general systems, but the low level things need to be very efficient, the hashes, the crypto things, will probably use the, some specific ZK languages and, and maybe coexist. That is my opinion. Uh -huh. Yeah, I agree with that in the sense that uh, you put a VM in a snark, there is an overhead. You have to understand the memory model. You have to understand what the how to decode instruction, how to have a trace of execution, and so on. So not necessarily the zkVM, but any type of VM, even if it's designed for snark, will have an overhead. But if in your protocol you just want to verify, I don't know, a bunch of Merkle proofs and signatures, then why bother having all this overhead of of having a VM on top of that? So I agree. Makes sense. Okay, that's the next question. Uh, if I could add to this, we have a slightly different perspective, which which is that. We think prover efficiency won't really be a big deal in the long term, just because it's so parallelizable. You know, we, we can take a very inefficient proof and we can split it up so each machine is doing one proving one transaction, and we can use many cores if we if we need to. Um, so we we our thesis uh, on our side is that really sequencing is the main bottleneck, and ultimately I think like languages should be chosen based on their sequencing performance or, or native execution performance um, because because that that's the much harder problem is how do we scale sequencing well yeah i understand what, what you're saying yes sequencing is hard but there are other sol solutions for this like shards sharding uh, of, of blockchains and maybe the bottleneck will be the total cost of, of making a, a proof that it could all, also be a possible scenario. So that I, mm -hmm. I still don't know how the future will look like, but both are po possible scenarios to me. Mm -hmm. Andre, uh, I guess there's more to discuss here, but uh, for the sake of time, let's move on to the next question. The third question is about uh, the challenges that someone would face in verifying programs that are written for ZKP. So I think I can comment a bit more on this. So uh, currently, um, so there are different kinds of level of verifications that we can do. For example, uh, you can do a, like an interactive theorem prover style, which will just, uh, you need some sort of expert to actually like, um, like specify all the properties that you want. So, the, so, so the, and then uh, currently there is another way which is called um, automatic um, formal verification where you actually, uh, for example, there are different styles of doing that. For example, we can do symbolic execution to actually uh, convert the whole um, ZK programs written uh, in the target language into uh, logical formulas and then you can provide it to the um, solvers. So uh, one of the challenges would be uh, how the user can actually uh, write those constraints or actually um, write their specifications, express the specifications in the uh, in the concrete language. And another challenge, I guess, uh, from the formal verifications perspective, is that um, um, we currently the like the, the efficiency of like solving all those uh, backend constraints would be uh, sort of like still need improvements. For example, we still don't have a, a specific like big prime um, theory for doing the verification right now. And then um, there are also some like, um, so there are actually also some like potential directions that we can actually um, 
um, try, for example, doing a um, concurrent kind of execution from the um, from the verification perspective in order to actually uh, eliminate those um, um, like a prime operations, prime number of operations in the in the finally generated constraints. So those are the probably the challenges and also like some like potential solutions um, from my point of view. Yeah, I, I want to uh, maybe also answer the, uh, the opposite question of maybe why it's easier to verify programs written for ZKP. Uh, if you look at the the right once memory model that was mentioned a few uh, times already, uh, we we uh, noticed like a lot of times when we looked at the, the, our programs that tried to verify their co correctness to see that they're reading uh, right. Uh, this actually very much helps to verify that things are maybe secure or are correct, run, run okay. Uh, in the fact that you, when you have memory, you have an object, you have things, you know that no one can change it. Like if you, after you call even a un, untrusted code from someone you don't know, know that once you re return, that your objects are all intact and the, all the invariants still hold. So that actually makes it sometimes a lot easier to reason about your program. I'll add one other point, which is I think there's really two ways to think about verification for programs in this domain. Um, the first is like what I call a verifying compiler. And then second is what I call one-shot proofs for programs. Um, in the verifying compiler concept, it's saying you wanna make sure that the compiler itself is, is outputting correct programs, meaning it itself is compiling and synthesizing you know, your circuit or, or, your, or, your, or your instructions um, correctly. And I think that that is a, you know, it's a significant challenge. Like uh, I think the last known effort in order to build something of that, that form has been uh, from 20 years ago with uh, regard to CompCert, which is a subset of C. Um, and then I think the other domain is really um, what we're talking about here, which is the, the one shot proofs for each program to say that, you know, I write uh, a program in a language here, um, it synthesizes out some output, uh, and I want to make sure that the constructed program itself is, is, syn is synthesized correctly based on my high level description. Um, and I think that, that this is, you know, a more tractable problem, um, but it also has uh, for the for the for the team developing that, um, you know, more complexity because you have to create a general framework that can handle all sorts of uh, semantic expressions. Whereas when you think about the verifying compiler, you just have to verify the passes of that compiler. So you can hard code specifically what, what each pass does and you can check those that exact logic. And, and I think that this creates two different types of paradigms to think about um, how to do verification. But, you know, I, I think both of them come with their own challenges and, and, it, and it really, it's really about managing complexity. I guess I, yeah, I agree. So somewhat uh, verifying the compiler, it's, it looks like more like a, like a one shot or maybe like a few shot um, effort in the sense that when you verify this compiler, you, have, you feel safe to use. And there are some other like, cases where you actually need to uh, uh, need a user to specify something on her like own like written programs. In that case, the user may not be able to like act like an expert and then use the indirective theorem prover like an expert. And in this case, we probably need to introduce some more like uh, automated methods to like help the user proceed. Yeah. Great discussion. Uh, I guess we can go to the next question. Right. So we have we have seen you know different types of programming languages today, um, and uh, there are like different chains that that are uh, where you can deploy applications written in certain languages. But what if you have a developer who wants to deploy his application on multiple chains at the same time, right? Uh, uh, how would you deal with that? Yeah, that, that's a tough question. I think today the EVM is the closest thing we have to kind of a common standard that's supported by quite a few platforms. but. You know, as we've discussed, it's not really the the ideal language, especially for zk rollups. Um, so, if if I, I I hope that something will replace it at some point. I I think, uh, and this is my personal opinion on it. I, I get the sense, looking at how programming languages for quote unquote Web two evolved, um, 
that we might not actually end up with a, with, with a great answer, that um, I think there'll be many solutions and many platforms. And I think maybe that is a good solution, um, but uh, you know, it's, it's really difficult to you know, make Ruby on Rails interact with, uh, with Node.js today. Um, you, know, you have to do quite a bit of bridging or you, you kind of invent a serialization standard, say JSON, in order to, to easily pass state between the two systems. Um, I think that will probably end up with some concept of REST APIs in this domain, um, which today I think that the, the closest look is, is smart contracts that you know, every function in a smart contract is like a REST API endpoint you can hit. Um, I think we may end up with some generalized notion of that uh, as we kind of evolve into, into additional languages and additional chains. Yes, I, I, I like the answer. I think with time, uh, maybe similar things will uh, emerge, like uh, maybe say similar uh, API for contracts and indeed the uh, ABIs to how call, to call each other, maybe also crypto co constructs that are very friendly to, to uh, ZK uh, that to somehow uh, be good for everyone. I, I think these kinds of, of things will emerge, but yeah, we, we probably can't expect something a lot better than this because it's it's a hard question i think right right yeah i i guess there is no clear answer here um and and probably uh, in the future we might actually have different languages to choose from when we want to develop uh, zero knowledge applications yeah and i also agree that at this point the closest thing that we have is, is the ZK, sorry, is the uh, uh, EVM, right? Okay, uh, uh, let's go to the next question. This question is kind of, I guess, related to the questions we have seen before. How do we avoid silos when there are multiple frameworks of languages to do ZKP? Uh, well, I would say uh, use uh, intermediate representations like uh, like vampire or uh, or others, um, yeah, we have uh, uh, lots of uh, people writing circuits for certain uh, specific use cases, and there's so many of these um, uh, artisanal tricks with writing circuits uh, that people use, um, <clears throat> and uh, you you have to. Uh, like read the the specs for you know Zcash or uh, or Alio or and so on to to see all these um, tricks and uh, I hope that we can um, share these tricks and uh, and use them in uh, in some um, some intermediate um, layers that are separated out um, so that. Uh, yeah, this information isn't uh, isn't so siloed up. Right, right, makes sense. We have a few more questions to go through, so and, and we don't have that much time. So sort of let's go through them uh, a bit faster. Um, the next question is about the trade-offs uh, in prover latency, size, costs, and customize customizability, um, and how do we decide what kind of prover should we choose? I mean that's a hard one to go quickly, but uh, yeah, it's a it's a use case thing, right? Uh, so some are very well fitted for, for example, for verifying on blockchain. If you want to do a very short verification on blockchain, you are looking at snarks because they are they are short and succinct, and you can verify them in a in, in, in a pairing and a couple of scalar mules. Uh, some are a bit larger proof, but they are easier to generate, or they give you more flexibility to, to express. Larger. So yeah, it's really hard take to do that in 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 fifteen seconds talk. Uh, I guess uh, we we should probably be better as an industry to 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 have some resources to really compare these various constructs. Um, new things are coming quite regularly, and even uh, us that works in the field is hard to keep up uh, with all the the, the new papers uh, coming every two months on on the topic. So yeah. yeah. So that's actually a very nice segue into the next question. Uh, you have uh, uh, you know new zero knowledge proofs coming out. Uh, every once in a while, right, uh, very frequently. And uh, should we just quickly try to adopt the latest and greatest zero knowledge proof? 
or should we try to like wait a little bit to see um, how secure it is? Um, you know, what do you have to say to that? Well, it depends uh, if you ask cryptographers or if you ask the market, right? The market is going to say, well, let's take the next shiny thing and let's make it work fast. And, and cryptographers are going to say, well, let's wait 10 years and, and, <laughs> and see how this holds. I think to, to one of Gautam's earlier points, like uh, I think venture capital should actually uh, fund a, a startup who's uh, who does the spark notes of ZKP systems, uh, uh, because uh, it's impossible even uh, even for people in industry in these companies to keep up with the stream of just ePrint uh, PDFs of all these new proof systems coming out. If someone could, uh, uh, you know, as a company, take these, digest them into Spark Notes so that I can, you know, just Google it and read what the properties are, what the assumptions are, what the trade-offs are, you know, in, in human form, um, rather than, you know, like 20 pages of math proofs, uh, <laughs> it would certainly help speed up, I think, everyone's decisions in terms of whether to use the system or not. Um, and uh, I think the other thing is that uh, with regards to just the just the the proof systems that that are coming out, like I, I I genuinely think that there are there is value to just taking things and using it. At the same time, like you know, coming from an academic perspective, like uh, you know, it is important to evaluate. But um, you know, even like for things like Plonk, it it wasn't a, a formal you know it wasn't a formal peer reviewed process where where Plonk was designed, right? Like this was something that that was kind of invented in industry and invented out of necessity. And I think that. That in and itself has kind of shown that that uh, there is value to taking new systems that may not have had that academic rigor and just running with it because um, there is value to you know the kind of intellect and the knowledge that people have already accumulated in this industry. Cool, thank you. Um, also, I, 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 a few words on that. I think that if this new system is enabling, is like giving you something that you needed to have and didn't before then yeah, sure. Otherwise, if it's like just 20% better in something, then use the foolproof thing that is tested. That is my opinion. Right, yeah. And, and that's a very fair thing to say. Um, I, I think sometimes when some something brand new uh, is proposed, uh, we should probably wait out a little bit to see if there, are, if there aren't any, any serious attacks on it, right? Uh, uh, the very first attempt at building something new might not be perfect. Um, but but at the same time, uh, there, there there might be value in uh, trying it out and, and seeing how it performs and, and behaves. Okay, next question, please. Um, I, I guess this is the last question we have. So we have seen so many different languages today, um, and and this question is kind of general. How can these different languages, these different uh, uh, you know the people working on these uh, different languages, they can support each other so that the technology evolves uh, as a whole and the ecosystem uh, uh, develops further? Uh, I, I can take a stab at this. So I, I think it would be extremely useful for everybody if we could have more of a, a common interface, something like the, the ZK interface that exists for R1CS programs. Um, but it, it's very challenging because let's say for with Stark frameworks, for example, we have so many different Stark frameworks with slightly different feature sets. So for example, some of them support pre-processed polynomials, some don't. Some support uh, lookup arguments or maybe just permutation checks in the framework. Um, the, some of them might support different window sizes, things like that. So it's, it's very hard to standardize until we really reach consensus on which, which features to standardize and which features are most useful. Yeah, I, I think that, that a good way to support is, first of all, just to be transparent in, in what we do, what we add in the language, in the ecosystem, in, in the proof system, and then steal, steal everything you think is good from other people. Yeah, that, that is my opinion. Right, stealing is good. Uh, so that brings us to the end of all the questions that we had for the panelists. Um, the floor is now open to the audience. If you have questions for any of the panelists, then please uh, share it on the chat. I can see there's the, that there is one question already here. Um, and uh, I, I hope all the panelists can see it. Um, yeah. It, yeah, the question is about the relative benefits and drawbacks of the various arithmetizations used by the protocols represented here. Spe specifically with respect to programming languages 
um, and Turing complete VMs. Uh, is this question written somewhere? Because I can't see, can't see it. Oh, I'm sorry. I think it was sent to just me. So let me share it with everyone. Oh no, I made a mistake. Yep, I think uh, you can see the question now. I, I mean, I can talk about the arithmetization we did for Cairo. Like I said, the maybe the the thing we interest interested us the most is efficiency, uh, mostly from proving time, uh, and it does cost in in, in other places like uh, the maybe less conventional memory model, uh, although it sometimes uh, is just fine, and in compatibility with EVM and. Yeah, um, and also making it too complete it has obviously a lot of benefits that you, we can uh, run arbitrary programs uh, and it, it is more similar than to what you would expect from a language and you can run arbitrary code from, for example, if uh, if someone sends you send you code, a Cairo code, like another Cairo program can just execute it because it's to incomplete. Uh, so you know, the, the general uh, pros and cons of a, a, an architecture. I, I think one of the the, the challenges, um, which may be a drawback or and also potentially like, I'm actually very interested to know how, how other people are thinking about this is the ability to write custom constraints um, in these various languages. Like, like I think in the case of of, um, of Cairo and Turing complete uh, VMs, that this isn't that big of an issue because you have an instruction set that uh, you know can can map, and so it actually doesn't matter as long as there's a handful of people with domain specific knowledge, it's okay. But I think for the for the zk languages that are you know taking a Planck like approach, you know, you know the, the the UI UX at least from what I've seen for for writing you know custom circuits uh, yourself, uh, it can almost be a uh, uh, a pain like uh, like you want to tear your hair out because it's not exactly clear um, what the representation from from one system to another maps to or looks like. Um, I definitely think that's where the, the you know credits to, to the vampire approach makes sense. Um, I, I also just am wondering you know how how are people thinking about um, the developer experience when they you know want devs to actually write stuff that maybe is lower level. Sorry, I have to, there's one more question from the audience and I have to really go have a meeting at 10.30. Um, this question is this question is for Gautam. Are there any performance downsides uh, building the API in Golang rather than Rust? Uh, actually, the, for the benchmark we have, uh, we, we have faster than our quarks and uh, other library, some other library. We are on par with Barrett and Bell, for example, for, for many things. So, I mean, and again, we are not showing numbers because mostly the, the good library in the space are within uh, like five to 10% kind of differences. It, and it's not going to be the, 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 the key part, right? Uh, some projects are also exploring uh, backends with GPU or FPGAs. Uh, but yeah, mo mostly we are uh, we are very happy with the performance. Uh, the, the some original issue you know that you could think is you have a garbage collector in Golang and how do you deal with that? And there is techniques you know basically you avoid uh, using interfaces and pointers and, and then you are you are very good. The runtime is very fast. Uh, we have very very little assembly code compared to other code bases and and we are uh, again uh, quite fast. Uh, feel free to check the benchmark and benchmark for yourself. Uh, cool. Thank you. Uh... Uh, and, and and I'm sorry if it was a bit rushed in the end. Um, uh, there wasn't much time left, uh, unfortunately. But if 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 the audience has more questions, uh, there's a Telegram group that you can join and post your questions there. Um, and and they they you know whenever the speakers have have time, they would answer those. Uh, so I would like to thank you everyone. Uh, thank everyone. You know uh, it was great to have such a such a great panel of uh, speakers. 
Um, and uh, I had, uh, I personally learned a lot today. I hope uh, everyone learned something as well. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, have a great rest of your day. Bye. There is a Thank there's very much. Telegram group. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. Let me share it with everyone. This is the link to the Telegram group. Uh, and there's also a question of, about the recording. Uh, we, we'll, we can post about that on the, on the Telegram group itself. We can answer that question there. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.